Hello, my friends across the fruited and rooted plain. It's time for the Gardening Simplified Show with Stacy Hervella, me, Rick Weiss, and our engineer and producer, Adriana Robinson. Hey, today we're going to talk about landscape layering. Yes, layering. Now, from cakes to clothing, lasagna to soil, atmosphere to bed sheets, many things in our lives come in layers. Stacy, I think about seven layer salad, the go-to salad that you bring to potlucks or family holiday in- dinners. And I think everybody eats those things because uh, they top them with cheese and bacon and they add a little sugar to them. You know, I like uh, the seven layer bars where oh. they got the like chocolate chips and the oh, coconut yeah. and all that. That's, that's my more, yeah. more my style of layered foods. But, I would know, agree. I feel it. I mean, the seven-layer salads, they never measure the amount of mayo and Miracle Whip. And by the way, Miracle Whip is great to put on your houseplants this time of the year to shine the leaves, but that's for another show. Okay. Okay. All right. So today we'll talk about layering. Now, we seek depth and dimension in our landscape, layers of interest. What do the most interesting gardens all have in common? Well, they've got a focal point, a path, and a border, great plant variety, but layering without overcrowding is tricky and there's far more to it than simply putting the tall plants in the back and the short plants in the front and i want to start off stacy by saying that with landscape layers i think uh, three components are critical one the first one is a layer of structural plants these plants are the bones the foundation of the design a four season year-round presence and that's why many times evergreens are used for this layer. The second layer is seasonal plants using a wide variety of plants with peaks at different times of the year. This ensures, you know, waves of interest throughout the year. Perennials, flowering shrubs are perfect for that. And then the functional layer, which is ground cover and filler plants. Uh, That's the layer that's kind of a living mulch or a carpet, a continuous border. Ground covers and annuals are perfect for this level. We call it plants at the toe level. So taking an elementary initial approach, I kind of look at it that way. That's a really good way to look at it. I mean, it's it's much simpler, right, if you try to break the landscape into elements yes. than to just try to approach it as one big whole. And that's what we do in our Gardening Simplified Landscape Guide as well, is mm-hmm. we break it down into these different elements. And when you combine the low hedge and the ground covers and the specimens and all of that other stuff, then you do with proper, you know, siting, end up with a with a layered landscape. So I will put the link to a landscape, uh, our Gardening Simplified Landscape Guide, not to be confused with our show, Gardening Simplified On Air, uh, to so people can use that as a resource when they're checking out I our like show notes. That. I like that. That'll be very helpful. It's fun to layer a landscape. Of course, you have to apply the design principles of repetition, scale, flow, and depth. Um, I love repetition along the front border of a landscape because it kind of ties the whole thing together. Uh, On our show notes and on our YouTube video, uh, we'll post a picture of Queen Elizabeth Park near Vancouver, uh, a picture that I took that I think really points that out. But repetition and balance, in other words, some continuity as your eye moves from left to right, maybe a place where your eye can rest. And then Another thing that I like to do, uh, Stacy, with the layering is that, again, it's not just tall plants in the back to shorter plants in the front. It's great to put a few taller plants in that center filler area that we use as exclamation points. It really adds interest. Absolutely. That is a pro move right mm-hmm. there to, to do that and not just be like short, medium, tall. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I, I'm glad that you mentioned this park because I think one of the best ways to, you know, find a a, a way to layer your garden or or compose in layers is to to take inspiration from another garden that you've seen. And instead of just looking at it and going, oh, that's really pretty, but I couldn't do that. Instead of just sort of walking away, take the time to dig in and, you know, even sketch it out um, and, and 
make a plan on paper of how that was composed. And then you really see that it's very simple. It all sounds very complex and it is very complex if you try to attack it from the top down. But when you do break it up into these individual components, you know, I think your point about repetition is a great one because what could be simpler than just repeating the same plants? You don't have to reinvent, you know, your entire garden scheme all the time throughout the garden. You can just repeat those same plants or in, in new combinations. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you really start to look at it, it does become simpler yeah. and that's what we're all about. Yeah. When I, for example, when I went to Bouchard Gardens, took lots of pictures. Then you get back home, you look at the pictures, you try to emulate some of those pictures and what they do. Now, of course, of course with uh, Bouchard, there are all sorts of levels. And I think that for layering, one of the things to look at is modulating elevations. So if you just have a flat surface, it can get a little weary on the eye or rather busy when you look across. But if you were to grade or use hardscaping to elevate some areas, lower some areas, change or modulate the elevations, I think that that's another important principle in layering your landscape. And a really simple way to do that without investing a ton of money, well, you still have to invest some money, but would be a really large container. Yeah, there you go. You know, it doesn't always have to be like a full construction project. Um, just getting a really large container and putting that in your garden or a fountain That's can a work as well. Point. So there's always these different ways. Mm -hmm. um, if we take the time to, to dig in and solve our problems, you know, through the knowledge that we have, rather than just being completely overwhelmed, which believe me, I get it. It's easy to be completely overwhelmed when it comes to garden design. Yeah, it's a great point, Stacey. Uh, it's tall. I like these tall, narrow containers. Again, mm. that could be an exclamation point within a drift yeah, or a absolutely. landscape like that. Let me give you a limerick on layers. I'm scratching my head thinking, well, how am I going to do a limerick on layers? And then I thought, well, here in West Michigan, it's snowing like crazy and it's super cold. We have Arctic temperatures. So I tend to layer my clothes. Mm -hmm. Layers are a form of preparation, a multi-layer clothing proration. When you're hot, you're hot. When you're not, you're not. First we freeze, then there's perspiration. Three layers I thought would suffice. No need for self-sacrifice. There's a reason they call it a sweater. I sweat and then I get wetter and in minutes it turns to ice. So in winter I'll dress in layers. Apparel, it comes in pairs. Soon I'll be sweating and then I'll be getting your sympathetic stares. I have difficulty wearing sweaters. I get overheated. Oh, I yeah? just do. Yeah. So... So, you know, you got to dress in layers in the Midwest and here in Michigan, especially at this time of the year. So three important elements in layering landscapes, uh, variation in foliage size and foliage texture. I think the foliage size issue is important because if everything is a small leaf or a similar leaf, it gets so busy, it just doesn't look right. A mix of shapes and sizes in the midsection. The middle doesn't have to be filled only with modestly sized plants. We talked about the exclamation points. And then Stacy, underplanting. Now, not underplanting as it relates to less plants, but rather there are some plants that you can plant under the canopy, whether it's a tree or a flowering shrub that that are suited and work quite well to kind of fill in those areas. Again, a filler area of underplanting. You know, a classic choice for underplanting, heuchera. Oh, yes. You know, there's so many heuchera these days. You think, how am I going to use these? Wow, there's just so many. I don't even know how to pick. Just get like three colors of heuchera or pick one color and then pick sort of variations on that color because there's you know, so many different options now. That's a perfect one. Carex or sedge is another great yes. one. There's so many good options that aren't just useful in terms of the aesthetic contribution, but also in terms of the environmental contribution because a lot of people these days are using those underplantings as like a living mulch. Heuchera is a great idea because there's many different colors. It has color all season long. And I also like the size of the foliage on heuchera. It has a little uh, gravitas, uh, just like hostas also would work well as underplanting uh, plants. Except in winter. Except in winter. <laughs> exactly. So think about repetition, scale, depth, and balance when you layer your landscape and Make a note to head out this summer and visit some gardens, take some pictures, study them closely, look at these concepts. 
where you can take those pictures and those ideas and bring them home to your landscape. And, you know, you don't have to wait till summer. There's so much great inspiration you can get online um, just by searching different gardens or garden designers and looking at their work, both old and new. I know two of my favorites for inspiration are Dan Pearson, who is still practicing, and, of course, Christopher Lloyd um, from England. I mean, just incredible, incredible plantsmen and garden designers, as well as books. You know, sure. spend an afternoon in your library looking at some nice, glossy garden books. Now, that sounds like a good way to spend a cold, snowy afternoon. Sounds like a fantastic way. So layer your landscape. Plants on Trial coming up next here on the Gardening Simplified Show. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. It's the time of the show where we put a plant on trial, which is to say that we're going to tell you all about it, and then you get to decide if it's going to earn a spot in your garden or not. And today's plant on trial, I'll just get right to it, is Chesky Gold Dwarf Birch. Chesky. Chesky. Gold yeah. Birch. Dwarf Birch. Dwarf birch. Yeah, this is a tree. It's a shrub. We're going to get to all that in a second. <laughs> but first, I always like to tell everyone, you know, why we're talking about this particular plant in today's plant on trial. And it's for two reasons. Number one is because it is a great layering plant. Okay. And, you know, one thing that we didn't really get to talk to too much in the first segment, and we were talking about that middle layer. Now, this plant reaches two to four feet tall and wide. So if you live in a colder area, it's probably going to be more on the lower end of that. If you live in a slightly warmer climate, it could get more to the forefoot. So it is kind of that front middle range for most for most borders. But we didn't really talk about the concept of a see-through plant oh. as a middle layer. And this is really important. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, is you start to kind of apply this lens to different plants, you'll it will quickly become apparent. A see-through plant is a plant that you can have in the garden. And it can be, it's usually on the taller side, but instead of just being like a big blob in the landscape, it has space and air in it. And you can see through it to the plants behind it or to whatever is behind it. And that's a really important part of layering because in a layered garden, it's not just supposed to be, again, just those big blobs that, you know, are, mm -hmm. it, I love plants with space and light and air in them. And this is a really great plant. For that, So it's a really good plan, again, for that sort of middle to back or medium layer um, and uh, just has a beautiful texture. Now, the other reason that we're talking about it today in particular, as we are in the midst of a polar vortex of single digit Fahrenheit temperatures here in the in Michigan, um, is it is also one of our hardiest shrubs. I saw that zone two all the way down to usda zone two whoa that's cold that is very cold uh i don't think that outside of there's very many people who live in areas outside of usda zone two um because it is so cold and inhospitable um but even if you are that cold then you can grow successfully and very happily i might add Chesky Gold Birch. So those two things I thought would make this particular plant a great choice for today's plant on trial. I think that's perfect. And your point about see-through, that is really great for a layered garden. Uh, three to four foot tall ornamental grasses play that same mm -hmm. role mm -hmm. for me too. And there's movement. Yeah. yeah. Movement. I think movement is also an important part of yeah. that. Now, the ultimate, you know, I think when people think of a see-through plant or this concept, they think of Verbena bonariensis. Mm -hmm. And Proven Winners has an annual for uh, seedless Verbena bonariensis, which isn't going to self-sow, but it's real short. Meteor showers. Yeah, meteor yes. showers, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, like the old-fashioned kind that is taller. That's to me like the ultimate see-through plant where you're really going to have that structure and color and presence, but again, without it being a total blockade. It's not sure. a plant goalie blocking off everybody behind it. So now I'm going to guess, as our listeners are listening and, and maybe not watching and seeing the plant on YouTube. Another good frigid ice reference. Very oh, yeah. well done. <laughs> I guess yeah. I'm just, you know, I guess my brain's half frozen with this weather. <laughs> um, so most people, when they hear birch, they're probably already thinking in their head of, you know, the snow white paper bark birch, right? That's what comes to mind for most people when you say birch. Or if it's not our paper bark birch, then they probably have a river birch, which has sort of come to take over paper bark birches, which are um, susceptible to some pests and diseases. 
don't particularly love hot suburban not at all. areas where no. they are very often planted, mm-hmm. or at least where when I was a kid, most of those are not around anymore. Certainly when you go up north, you see those paper bark birches doing well. So um, river birch has kind of come in as a substitute. It's not pure white. It has kind of an orangey color uh, to it, which I think they're, they're quite nice. I've oh, seen some beautiful, beautiful specimens of them. Um, well, this is like neither of those. So it is a dwarf shrubby birch. And most people have never heard or seen a shrubby birch. So instead of a tree with a single trunk and and branching, it's a nice, almost like a dome shape. Um, You know, a lot of times I talk about things being kind of like rounded. And I was looking at the pictures of this and thinking, you know, it really does look like a dome, but not a really dense dome like a mum does, you know, in fall where that's not a see-through plant at all. (laughs) Um, So it has this really elegant, nice domed shape. um, And the branches are uh, a pretty kind of red tan and they're very thin and slender and elegant. So they're, you know, they just have this light texture. Now, those branches then get uh, bedecked in the season with this adorably tiny leaf. And you really kind of have to see it to know what I'm talking about. Um, but they're they're really small, like the size of maybe a pinky nail. And they have a serrated edge and they're bright yellow. Okay. When they come out. So that's where the gold part comes from. So this is a plant that, you know, it's not the showiest plant. And I think that's also a really important part of a layered garden. It's not everything in your layered garden can be a star. You right. need some supporting players here who are not going to come in and be that diva and demand all the attention. You want a cast that supports each other. And this is a really nice, quiet, but not too quiet, supporting character for your garden. Two things. One, I'm contemplating on that word, be decked. I like that. Uh, secondly, uh, while you were talking, I pulled up the pictures here. Foliage and st- almost looks like nine bark to me. Oh. Or, you know, I could see that, that yeah. Style, yeah. It has, I would say the serration on the edge is very similar okay. to, to nine bark, but it's much, much smaller. Okay. And it's in and nine bark foliage uh, is very often sort of trident shaped. It has like kind of three mm-hmm. points. And this is yep. just like one little... Like I said, it would just like fit on your little pinky nail. Okay. Um, so very, very uh, interesting foliage, great texture. Um, it's beautiful. Yeah, it is. a, and, and I just, you know, it's so important when we're in the garden center, it's very easy to be distracted by those super showy things. Oh, I got to have that. But your garden, you know, doesn't, does need some, again, just these softer things that that aren't boring at all. I mean, this plant is is still contributing a lot of color, still contributing a lot of character, but just not demanding all the attention all the time. Now that that gold foliage is by far, and that picture you're looking at there, Rick, um, is in spring. So when it leaves out in spring, then it's really, really going to be showy. Now it does flower. It has just kind of your regular birch catkin. So not Mm -hmm. something that you would probably even notice not really showy, but that uh, golden color does continue to emerge through the season as the new growth comes out. And then it matures to a really pretty fresh green color. I could see this in drifts in that middle ground of a layered landscape. I could see why you picked this plant for a layered landscape. It's and gorgeous. for a cold day. Don't forget that. And a cool day. <laughs> Now, uh, this plant does come to us from Michael or Michal Andrusiv of the Czech Republic. And that is where the name Chesky Gold comes from okay. to honor his homeland. Nice. Um, and again, we call it Chesky Gold Dwarf Birch. So people don't get it confused with the tree like birch. So that's where that funny name, name comes from. It is C E S K Y, not C H or C Z, as the Czech Republic would be. Because um, we had to, to make it somewhat pronounceable, right? Mm hmm. Um, but it, so this is a plant that, yes, it works great in landscape layers. It also works really well on its own. It's a good front of border plant. It's good for natural garden. So really it's kind of one of those super versatile, however you want to use it in your landscape or garden, it will work. If I layer it into my garden 
probably want to get it as much sun as possible? So uh, it depends. Okay. If, so certainly if you live in the colder climates, it's going to be able to take full sun. Okay. Um, but, you know, that color could be a lot stronger. It can take part shade easily and it can even grow in full shade. However, in full shade, you're definitely not going to be getting that golden color. Okay. You know, if it's if it's too dark, it's just not going to have those pigments and it's going to be more green. Now, it will still look beautiful and it will still grow fine, but you just, again, have to have those expectations of what's actually going to happen if you put it in that kind of uh, environment. And um, it, it does need moist soil. So this is not a plant that I have in my garden, as uh, our listeners have probably heard me talk about before. It's very dry. It's very sandy. So as much as I really enjoy this plant, I don't have it because it will want more water. So it's great for clay soil. Maybe our friend from England last week's uh, show could have. Oh, I have an update from our friend Excellent. in England uh, in, in our mailbag. Good. So stay tuned to hear from Kurt. Um, but yeah, this is going to be a great plant for clay soil. Good for shade. Now, as I said before, a lot of plants that are very hardy, like Chesky Gold Dwarf Birch, don't have similar heat tolerance. And that is certainly the case here. This plant is not going to go much beyond USDA zone seven. So sorry to our warm climate friends, but uh, enjoy where you're at because it's not two degrees there for you, hopefully right now. Uh, two to four feet tall and wide. Again, um, full to parts on, uh, part shade or full shade is fine. You're just not going to get as much color. Not significant flowers, but it's a, a disease resistant, easy care plant that adds just the right amount of color and texture. Kind of a no brainer. Yeah, it is. It's perfect. I, uh, I say this is a winner and uh, scores here in <laughs> Plants on Track. It shoots these scores. And you can go to gardeningsimplifiedonair.com to find all the information. We're going to take a little bit of a break. And when we come back, we've got the gardener mailbag. So please stay tuned. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. Uh, one of the ways we simplify gardening for you is by answering your garden questions. And even here in the midst of a polar vortex, or maybe I should say especially so, yes. because we do have some concerned listeners that we're going to be answering their questions today, or is my plant going to be okay because it's going to be X temperature this week or whatever. So we will get to all of that. But if you have a question for us, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at help, H-E-L-P, at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com or just go to gardeningsimplifiedonair.com and click on the contact form. You can also leave a comment on YouTube. Adriana lets us know if there's any of those that need answered. So there's lots and lots of ways to get a hold of us. And I wanted to start off today with an update from Kurt. Oh, Kurt. Kurt. So uh, last week we talked about Kurt in England. He just wet his plants. <laughs> yes. yeah, someone did. And he was dealing with some horrendous flooding in his yard there in England, standing water. Oh. I mean, it was kind of hard to believe it was even a yard. It looked like it could be a swamp or something. And, um, you know, a lot of people on YouTube left comments. So Kurt, I don't know if you check out our YouTube channel, but if you want to see what other people have to say about your, about your water issue, uh, you can read those there. But he uh, writes and says the water has drained and the shrubs appear to be okay. Yay. So glad to hear that. Um, but he also shared a new problem. <laughs> oh. and, and, and I, and, and Kurt's concern is something that I've heard from multiple gardeners over the past couple days. So I thought I would just kind of tie it all up into this timely concern. So Kurt says that now they're calling for nine inches of snow in England and temperatures down to 14 degrees Fahrenheit. Now he says that his garden is usually considered USDA zone eight. So that is definitely pushing the boundaries of what would be USDA zone eight. But not unusual uh, as far as what we see here in the States. No, for, uh, this, for the US it wouldn't be super. Yeah, down south in January, boy, we can, whether it's Oklahoma, Texas, Alabama, yeah, I mean, I've been hard. to New Orleans and needed a hat and gloves yeah. and winter coats, so it, it can happen. It, it happens. probably happens less uh, in England. And he is worried about his fig tree with this weather. And he sends a picture of his fig tree, and I thought, you know what? I don't want to leave a bad taste in people's mouths about Kurt and his flooded garden. So Adriana is going to put a, a very cheerful and lovely picture of Kurt's garden and his yeah. fig tree that he's concerned about um, on the YouTube version of the show. Of course, it will be in our show notes at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. 
So Kurt's worried about his, his uh, fig tree in these unusually cold temperatures. And I also heard from James in Texas, where again, they're having unusually cold weather. And he's worried about his Perfecta Mundo azalea. So he said, do I need protection at 20 degrees Fahrenheit for the Perfecta Mundo double blooming azaleas? So I'm, I know there's lots of people out there wondering. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to sort of take this back to this concept of USDA hardiness zones. A couple of weeks ago, a new hardiness zone map came out. We did a whole show on the hardiness zones. So this is where hardiness zones are useful. Um, as I said in the show, there's a lot of places where hardiness zones have a lot of shortcomings. But but one useful place is that they, they give you a sense of how much cold those plants can take. So in the case of both the fig, now there are some exceptions to figs. There are some fig varieties that are less hardy than others. But for the most part, uh, figs are considered hardy to USDA Zone 7. There is a couple that are even hardier. But but I'm just going to go with the middle ground of Zone okay. 7 for the fig. And Perfecta Mundo Azaleas also happen to be hardy to USDA Zone 7 or 6B, but we're going to say 7 for the sake of argument here. Now, if you look at the USDA key of what those temperature range is for that hardiness zone, USDA Zone 7 is actually 0 degrees Fahrenheit. Wow. So, and as we talked about on our hardiness zone map show, we're looking at average minimum temperature. Yes. And so if the temperature is going to dip to 20, he's still well above, uh, well above that minimum. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's a really good sign that the plants are probably going to be okay. But now we have to get back to sort of one of the shortcomings of the hardiness zone system. Uh, which is that it does not address how long it is going to be okay. that cold. Now, right. you know, for me to sit here and say, oh, well, you know, it's down to US or uh, the zone seven is down to zero. Well, we've had uh, temperatures around zero degrees Fahrenheit, not wind chill. This is air temperature. So people might be thinking, well, shoot, then why aren't we USDA zone seven here in Michigan? Because we rarely get much colder than we are right now. But the difference, again, is how long those sure. temperatures last. And, of course, our temperatures can get much lower. They don't typically. But that's the issue here is how long are those temperatures, those extreme cold temperatures, going to be around? And that's how you're going to determine whether or not you should protect those plants. It's a good point. In my mind, it's similar to uh, a hard frost in spring. Yeah. The duration of that frost overnight. Yeah, it definitely makes a huge, huge difference. Now, mm -hmm. here in Michigan, uh, we're getting those single-digit air temperatures, but I got two feet of snow on the ground, mm -hmm. so all my stuff is like, hey, that's cool. I can insulation. take it. A lot of insulation. But, of course, if you're in Texas, you probably don't have that. So, you know, I would say keep use that hardiness and zone range as your guide if it's a newer plant, then you're probably going to want to protect it just because it hasn't yet developed, you know, the root system um, that it needs to fully withstand the challenges of winter. Um, if you feel if you have the means to protect it in the time, well, then it's certainly not going to hurt either. You know, just putting an old sheet or a blanket or, you know, a lot of garden centers will sell frost blanket or reme. There's a lot of different things that you can buy to just sort of drape over them and get them through. Uh, now, Kurt's uh, fig is a tree, so it's not a shrubby fig. But the good news, Kurt, as lovely as your fig tree is, if it does, it's, it's much harder to protect something like that. But if it does get very, very cold, you will not lose your fig tree. It will just die back and you'll have a shrub instead of a tree. Sure. So, And if you drape, be careful. Uh, if the winds are high oh, yeah. or you get ice, well, you can do some damage to That's the plant. That's true. That That's a really too. good point. Yeah. yeah. Don't try to take it off until until things are safe. So again, that's where the hardiness zone system can work for you. So if you're concerned, don't worry so much about where you're at, but look at what your plants can withstand. Protect if you need to and uh, and hope for the best because this is, this is where you learn. And hopefully you're not losing anything too precious and valuable to you. So Stacy Marvel writes to us, I planted two three-gallon lemony lace elderberry shrubs in late spring 2022. I've been doing some research on pruning these shrubs, as this is the first time I have ever grown elderberry. You're going to love it, Marvel. <laughs> Uh, I've found somewhat conflicting information on my online searches. Right. And so Marvel then goes on to, to list all of the different stuff that she found about how to prune uh, elderberries. And she's kind of saying like, so which do I do? Mm -hmm. And um, 
the answer to the question here is it really depends on why you are pruning in the first place. And I think that when whenever you're trying to research something and you see a lot of conflicting advice like this, what that indicates is that the pruning on this plant is going to be a highly subjective issue. Yeah. Now, if you read about rose pruning, you're going to find the same advice pretty much everywhere because the reason that you prune roses is essentially the same. You want to take off the, the thin spindly growth that was put on at the end of the previous season and make sure that the growth for the season is coming from those thicker buds lower down on the plant, which are going to be thicker, more vigorous, flower better, and also give you a more uniform flowering rather than, you know, flowering four foot off the ground with just a skinny little mm -hmm. sad flower at the top. So that for in those cases, we know why we prune them and therefore the pruning advice can be kind of generalized. But in the case of the elderberry, I think the reason that you're seeing so much different, you know, perspective on how to prune and when to prune and how much to prune and all of this is because it does depend on the why. So I would say to Marvel, why do you want to prune this? Is it is it's not something that needs to be pruned as a matter of course or habit. You can absolutely never prune an elderberry. It might get very large. I have an instant karma uh, variegated elderberry in my yard that's about 10 feet tall and wide, and I do love it. I've never pruned it, but it's healthy and beautiful, and um, and it's you know doesn't need it. Um, but if you so if you're trying to size control it, you know that's one that's a different consideration than if you're just trying to say, hey, I love the foliage on this plant. I want to coppice it. So it's a plant that can be coppice and then you can keep cutting it back and just getting those fresh shoots every mm -hmm. year. It would be a great middle of the border, mm -hmm. see-through kind of plant in yep. that regard. You can prune it into a tree. And so this is why, you know, we always say when it comes to pruning, never prune without a reason. If you don't have a reason, you really don't know what to do because there's a lot of different approaches in terms of timing, how much you cut off, where you make your cuts. There's so much. So you have to get your why straightened out before you get your how straightened out. I endorse that answer 100%. When I work in the garden center and somebody approaches me with a question like Marvel gave us, that those are the first words out of my mouth. Why do you want to prune it? You are 100% correct about that. And then after that, I usually suggest, well, then prune it during the dormant season mm. when you can get a good look at the shape of the plant and really determine, well, why am I pruning this? Am I pruning out weak branches, crossing branches, whatever it may be? So why is a great question. Yep. And, you know, also understand that if, if you prune it in the dormant season, it might lose its flowers. But if you are OK with that yep. or losing some of them, yep. you just have to do your research, which Marvel has done. So uh, next step is to decide the why. So we're going to take a little break. When we come back, we have a special guest for the final segment. So please stay tuned. Welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. T today for branching news, we're going to talk about biophilia. Biophilia. Now, maybe you've never heard that word before, but maybe it's something, well, you experience. And to help us sort it out, horticulturists, her herbalist and author Deborah Knapke. She's the garden sage, is going to join us here on the Gardening Simplified show. Deborah, always great to talk to you. Oh, same here. Same here. Deborah, uh, here in Michigan and in the Midwest, we're experiencing a significant cold snap in January. And we take it to another level in West Michigan and in Buffalo, New York, where the Great Lakes provide us something called lake effect snow. And that machine is turned on right now and it's snowing like crazy. <laughs> I look wow. out the window and I longingly look at my garden and I realize how much I miss it this time of the year, having my hands in the dirt and working with the plants. Deborah, am I experiencing biophilia? You're actually, you're, you're experiencing being away from biophilia. Okay. Um, having sort of a, a less of a connection. And just as, just as an aside, I grew up in Lake County in Ohio, which is Northeast Ohio. We were in the snow belt, and I know all about those lake <laughs> effect snow. <laughs> but being it, in central Ohio, um, we right now I have maybe sixteenth of an inch. Oh, oh wow! Um, Although it's uh, really, Deborah yeah. Lake County, uh, they get a lot of snow, and there are a lot they of do. plant growers in Lake 
County, and so it must be that snow provides good insulation. It does. And, and you know, it's interesting, and you asked about biophilia, and I'm going to connect this back in because it's understanding what plants need at different times of the year that's part of biophilia connection, um, mm. which I'll define in a moment. But that, that um, um, being able to be under a snug blanket. Now, I'm anthropomorphizing here, but I sometimes think that when we treat plants and animals and ecosystems, when we treat them like they're an object, instead of an entity, I feel, you know, all this life, um, then we start losing that connection of biophilia, which I'm going to define biophilia. It is our essential need, the human essential need to be connected to all other living things. So it was coined by E.O. Wilson in 1984. It actually had been used in the early 1900s, but in a different way. And E.O. Wilson, you know, the, the ant man, <laughs> he <laughs> is no longer with us, but he looked at society, ant societies and other insects, etc. But he said it is this connection with the other. And you just mentioned that here's your garden underneath all this snow, and you are suffering from a lack of connection but yet, isn't it nice to know that your garden's under this beautiful insulating blanket? That's true. And maybe if you, if you think about it that way, it might not be that wrenching to be away from it. And so then get go get a house plant. <laughs> <laughs> the practical side of biophilia, right? Right, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you know, right now I have my house plant. You know, if I could give you some visuals, I'd take you around to my greenhouse a little 15 by 15 hobby house or in the living room or in my office, I have plants because they make me happy and I have this connection with them. You know, it's, and I also have connection with my cat, you know, pet. That's another biophilic thing. If you think about it. Now, uh, getting back to that deep snow and these cold temperatures, but I'm not bitter about that, Deborah. Um, <laughs> One of the things that I miss is my hands in the dirt, but you Mm -hmm. were teaching us that, well, maybe it's not really dirt. It's not dirt. I had this conversation this morning with a colleague and she's working on a, a project to get people's hands, as she said, in the dirt. And I said, first of all, we're going to stop with using the term dirt because that's an objectifying kind of, of, of noun. Instead, think of it as soil. Think of soil as filled with biotic communities, you know, microorganisms, macroorganisms, fungi, bacteria, worms, beetles, you name it. But even, even though soil is sand, silt, and clay as its mineral portion, its living portion is absolutely amazing. So when you think of soil, it's a positive word. When you say dirt, it's that stuff underneath your fingernails that you want to wash off and get rid of. So I also work on language when I talk about biophilia and talk about that connection with others in the landscape and in the world is what kind of language do we use? I like that. You know, the the plants that we're putting in the ground – we're putting it into a living thing when mm-hmm. it's uh, when we look at it as soil as opposed to dirt. I really like that. Yeah, and also if given a, a choice, <laughs> I don't know if it's a choice or not, but plants grow so much better in soil that has an active living community because there's this the symbioses, there's the mycorrhizal fungi, there's the nitrogen fixing bacteria, there are the little tiny microorganisms that make micropores so that air and water can get through the soil and keep it friable so that roots can go through. It, it's this community. And I guess if you think about what biophilia is, it is being part of a community. 
You know, Stacy, that's probably why marketers put the words potting soil on the bag <laughs> as opposed to potting dirt. <laughs> potting mix. <laughs> potting, potting mix is what I use. <laughs> just saying. And that's still, you know, that's made up of living things that typically has compost and peat moss, which mm-hmm. it's not the same as soil. And it doesn't have that incredible, you know, scale of geological time that we experience when we are working in real soil. But, I mean, it's still a valuable, uh, you know, ecosystem that that does get created as you plant and work with it and and all of the components of potting soil comes from something from the earth yep the the the, the, the so, uh what is it perlite coming mm-hmm. from uh pumice and oh gosh vermiculite comes from my, mica i think expanded mica yes yeah yeah and peat moss etc so they're all still part of what was or is a living system. And even rock, you know, we talk about, well, is rock alive? We could get into a real interesting discussion there. But rock also has microorganisms that live in it that work with plants and roots, et cetera. Absolutely. It's fascinating once you start thinking about it. Definitely. So what happens, Deborah, when people do not understand biophilia. In other words, what happens when we do not connect? We're missing out, aren't we? We are. And, you know, I've, I've done talks on biophilia and I use four words. Um, when we do not connect, we have dis-ease or disease. We have disconnect. We have distress, you know, dis and stress. We have Stress, but negative stress, and we have disintegration. It, it, we aren't a part of it. We hold, we often hold ourselves apart from nature, or we think we can conquer it. I, I mentioned before, I think last time I was on, that I have a bumper sticker on my car that says "Nature bats last." You know, so that's when you sort of forget mm-hmm. <laughs> that that you're a part of this all. Mm-hmm. Um, not not the controller, right? Because every time you think you're going to control what happens, right? <laughs> yeah, that's that's where gardening comes in handy. It puts a, it gives you a lot of humility and really sets you in your place. <laughs> I I think it does. Uh, I think I think it is the garden where I actually where I finally grew up, <laughs> where I finally became a more mature person because I started seeing these interactions and the garden taught me patience. Um, The garden taught me about interconnection. And I think it's also when I started being able to read the landscape and read plants and understand what was going on and just being able to walk outside and say, Hmm, something's not right here. I need to figure this out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if biophilia is about a connection, a feeling for all that is around you, Deborah, give us our listeners and our viewers a a couple of tangible examples where uh, biophilia is uh, the the practical side of it, I guess. In other words, if, if you want to experience this and you want to be attuned to this, what is the practical side of biophilia? Part of it is, well, one, how do you interact with your garden? You know, do you immediately pull out the chemicals when you see a problem, if you've defined the problem well, but again, another discussion, but sure. you see something and you think, oh, the first thing I'm going to do is spray, spray something. But then maybe if you sit back and observe, you might notice that, okay, there's aphids on this plant and whoa. Look what just showed up to eat them, either the larvae or the adult form of the ladybird beetle or ladybug, whichever, whichever you wish to call it. But aphids are a big one. Mm-hmm. And, you know, disease organisms, when they come into the garden, you know, people will think, you know, let's, let's choose the juniper, the juniper and hawthorn mm-hmm. rust that goes back and forth. And the first thing is, oh, gosh, what can I spray? But really, you should be looking at, hmm, I have these junipers planted really close to these hawthorns. 
one of these two needs to go. Otherwise, this is going to happen every single year. And then if you notice your neighbors have them or have junipers, it might mean that the hawthorns get to go. Uh, or they will eventually because after repeated in- infections, very often they don't survive. But then maybe you go somewhere else and you realize there's this one hawthorn tree over here that isn't getting it. And this is a hawthorn tree that's figured out a way to deal with that infection. That's biophilia, being connected and understanding that this interaction is different. And, you know, being being a gardener, I think, oh, I want the resistant hawthorn in my garden. So that's a practical aspect of biophilia is through of observation, maybe understanding better how to have a garden and not being terribly reactive, you know, right away grabbing for a chemical or freaking out or whatever. Most of the time I sit back and take a look and think, hmm, you know, boxwood blight's one of those. Like, how can I beat this? And what is our gardening community, our growers, our horticultural community doing? We're looking for those boxwoods that don't get it. Mm. You know, that's practical biophilia. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Stacy, when I listen to Deborah talk, I, I'm thinking that biophilia, to an extent, is natural common sense. It is. Doesn't it feel uh, that way? I mean, it, it, it is, but it takes time to develop that. And I think, you know, we, I, I, I think that, you know, sort of what I'm hearing is that biophilia is an essential element of human nature, but then culturally, societally, you know, we start to take on these attitudes that say, if we see a, a leaf spot, that something has to be done, that it's not mm-hmm. tolerable, that it reflects poorly on us as homeowners, as neighbors or whatever, um, when in fact, you know, it's, it's just, it's just something that happens and it, and you can just, just be like, well, you, you can shrug it off. I mean, it's okay. You don't need right. to, to have, you know, this perfect so-called ideal landscape, you know, as you were giving the example of the, um, of the Hawthorne cedar rust, I was thinking, is it biophilia if you leave them both because you like to freak people out with the gymnosporangiums <laughs> in the spring? It's quite a sight to see. It is. Because that's what I would be doing. Right, right. <laughs> I was kind of proud when it showed up on my, my I mean, it's pretty first. cool. And the it pictures cool. the pictures are great to post in social media. Yes, it freaks people out. Yeah. Yeah. They are. I think they're pretty. I don't know. Call me crazy. But <laughs> that beautiful orange color. Now, they do get kind of, you know, like charcoal burnt looking mm-hmm. at the end when all the spores are released. So it's not as pretty, but Oh, initially it's like somebody hung ornaments in the juniper. <laughs> so, and that's a, to me, a biophilic response and that I'm enjoying the life. And if you think about it, everything in this world eats something else, yeah. you know, it's, it, it's, it's, I don't know why we think that we need, as you said, Stacy, this perspective, idea of, of, of a garden, you know, and, and an apple that doesn't have a blemish and all that. Shoot, I just make sure I don't eat the caterpillars when I harvest my kale and collards <laughs> from the garden. I like to get them off and put them back outside. <laughs> it's so true. And, and that, I think, really is where, you know, gardening is a game changer for people because, yeah, I mean, I was totally, before I started vegetable gardening, and this is many years ago now, but, you know, I would never go to the store and buy, like, a tomato that had a blemish. And then the first year that I grew tomatoes, you know, I had this beautiful tomato that was on the ground, and slugs had eaten a bit of it on the bottom, and I was like, there is no way that I am not eating this tomato. I'm just going to cut that part off. And then it just completely changes your understanding of what it takes to, to grow food. And and it, it changes your, you know, tolerance for what is ultimately a pretty natural thing to happen. Totally agree. Totally agree. It, and gardening does that. I think also having relationships with animals, whether they're pets inside or whether you have chickens or a goat or, you know, I've, I, when I was younger, I thought how cool it would have been. To live on a farm. I, you know, I just thought that would be so cool. 
I'm not so sure now. It's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> hard work. <laughs> it's hard work. But um, I think that farmers and people who work on the land as part of their life really have a different point of view. And the that biophilia, you know, here we're talking about a term. And there, someone out there sitting there and saying, well, shoot, everybody knows about this. They're just not paying attention. You know? right. yep. Something right. like that. Okay, so I will, uh, I'll let, we'll play complete the phrase, Deborah. Okay, I'm going to have you complete uh -oh. okay. this phrase, okay? Biophilia okay. is not curb appeal or your best lawn competition with your neighbor. But rather, biophilia is, and I'll let you complete that phrase. Ah, biophilia is creating a garden that makes you feel good and does not harm the earth or anything in it. Mm. Yeah, that's good. That's true. That's good. Yeah. Okay. And this is, uh, Deborah, this is a, a phrase. Uh, you mentioned uh, the phrase was coined uh, what in the 1980s is that what you said yeah 1984 by eo wilson in fact i have his slim little volume that he wrote about biophilia it's fascinating mm -hmm. i have uh, many friends in the garden center industry and uh, i have found and i mentioned to stacy and adriana that uh, my garden center friends on the west coast in california and seattle uh, we're really attuned to this and are right now and talk about it often. Uh, but it's really worked its way across the country and now I think has become more and more uh, mainstream uh, from coast to coast. And it has. I agree with that. I was doing research for creating my plant sciences course for Columbus State Community College and I stumbled on this very interesting organism called Mycobacterium vacae, which is in the soil. Mm. And a little bacteria, and when you work in the soil, you breathe in this bacteria. And what it does is it sparks serotonin production. And serotonin is the happiness hormone or chemical or sure. whatever it's called. Um, I'm not exactly sure what serotonin, which group it's in, <laughs> but, but you feel good when you're working in the soil. And that was in, um, oh, about 2008, 2009. And there were these studies about how people felt good when they worked with soil and they narrowed it down to this little mycobacterium vacae. So it's, it's kind of the mid aught 2000 aught even though this term was coined in 84, it really didn't get a strong purchase um, in farming and gardening, et cetera, to my knowledge, until after 2000. Hmm. Interesting. So, Deborah, can uh, next fall, can Rick dig up a box full of soil and bring it in and have this mycobacterium to get him through winter? Will that, <laughs> will that work to cure his winter blues next year? What a great <laughs> idea. It would help. It would help if he planted something in it. Okay. Too. Like moth. <laughs> it's a dirty job. Somebody's got to do it. That's it's right. a soily job. It's a soily it's job. A soil. <laughs> so see there, I think dirty might work better. <laughs> you know, we can, we can laugh about it, but, but, I would admit that I love the look of soil. I love the feel of soil. I love the smell of soil. Often when people would come into the garden center with a house plant that was struggling, uh, right. often I would pull it out of that plastic pot and stick my nose in the soil. I could quickly tell by the, the, the aroma of this, you know, if it was underwatered, overwatered, whatever. I, I think that yeah. there, I think it's a real thing. I really do. I love dirt. Now, of course, it's not fun to track into the house and, and have to do the laundry and that kind of stuff, but I'm sticking with it. I love dirt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think gardeners do, you know, I used to think, oh my gosh, maybe my nails aren't perfectly clean. Now I don't care. <laughs> you know, unless I'm going somewhere really hoity-toity, you know, where I have to look really good. But I don't do that much anymore. 
So, well, um, I'll tell you what, yeah. Deborah, you've uh, inspired us all. You've inspired me. As a matter of fact, when I leave the studio here today, I'm going to go to a garden center, buy a bag of potting soil and stick my face in it. And I think I'll feel <laughs> there good. you go. I think that will just don't breathe in too deeply because it's all that dust. Yeah, in there yeah, there can so be fertilizer. In it too. No, I understand. <laughs> I understand. Her, her name is Deborah Knapke, and she is the garden sage. Uh, always a pleasure to talk to you. And Deborah, uh, of course, you're an author. Also, share your uh, your website with our listeners and our viewers. It is debrathegardensage.com and it is undergoing revision right now it's the old website but pretty soon um, I will have new information on it and um, a slightly different look but not much I'm keeping most of the pictures and some more text but once yeah the www.debrathegardensage.com and that's Thank d-e-b-r-a you. yes it's, it's D-E-B-R-A, yeah. correct. Okay. <laughs> correct. All right. Great. And it is always a pleasure to talk to you and Stacey. Oh, likewise. Pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. And uh, hang in there. Spring's on the way. <laughs> it is. Bye. Bye-bye. Well, speaking of spring almost being here, you know we're halfway to the spring backdrop today. Oh, Yes. Yes, so I can't wait sure for So that's a sure sign of spring. <laughs> so only six more weeks with this backdrop, and so spring is on the way. So thank you so much to Deborah. Thanks to you, Rick. And, of thank course, you. thanks to Adriana. And thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the show. We'll see you next week.